I guess, um, about device drivers in Hurt. Yeah. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, I will talk about user learn device drivers on GNU Hurt, uh, but I will also introduce a bit uh, about GNU Hurt. Um, the one of the thing we want to emphasize about GNU Hurt is that it's all about freedom zero. That is, the user can use his computer and for any purpose with any combination of software and whatever that means freedom from the system administrator why should i have to look inside slash has been to find fdisk mkx2 fs etc uh, there's no reason i shouldn't be able to use these uh, i should just be able to use the portion of the disk i'm, I'm assigned and some network bandwidth and do whatever i want to do with it uh, that's also f the freedom to innovate, to combine things together, to, to have new ways of using the resources of the computer. Uh, so, be it using experimental file systems, have your own personal workflow, new kinds of process combinations. Uh, we'll see uh, a couple of examples. Uh, but it's also providing uh, freedom from the misbehaving programs. And here, uh, in particular, the drivers what happens if the driver behaves badly. Uh, it's, it has been like for one or two years uh, that when I would switch off my lights in my desktop, then my laptop would crash. The reason why that uh, the small uh, increase in, uh, in the power line would make my external disk reboot and that would, be, that would disturb my Linux kernel, it would crash. So, this shouldn't happen, there's no reason that this should, kind of things should happen. Um, another, another way to introduce this, uh, I got an email, uh, a friend of mine uh, asked me would it be possible to route uh, to my VPN the traffic of only one application. I want only that application to be using the VPN, not the other ones. And actually that's quite well known issue with the VPNs. Uh, you have uh, one routing table uh, and unless you know the powerful tools to do uh, more advanced routing, uh, it's not easy to, to get that kind of thing. And still here, uh, he is root on the machine. Uh, what if you are not root on your machine? Well, GNU Hurt can do this, actually. Without asking root, you can do that uh, as a mere user. Um, I won't go into details in all these, but mostly it's the extensibilities that we can think about uh, so you can uh, manipulate your files the way you want, manipulate the network you want with VPNs, access virtual networks, uh, redirect your sound, etc., etc. And here I will be talking about a flexible hardware support. Um, so this is the outline of what I will be presenting. So I will make uh, a few reminders about the HUD um, and the network flexibility that uh, we can provide and the DD stack that we have been using for this. Uh, I hope I will have time to talk about the console, uh, which is a nice thing we have uh, nowadays, the hardware support and software support and release and feature. So just a few reminders. Uh, the idea of the herd is to have most of the things in user land. And so we have a kernel which mostly um, manages the tasks the memory and communications between processes and that's everything it, it does nothing more and then you have um, PFI net for the TCP, TCP IP X2FS for the file system and um, PROC for managing processes and OAuth to uh, manage the users and then what happens is that when a shell wants to uh, open a file then it discusses with X2FS to actually open a file the kernel doesn't even know about open file all it does is communications between processes. Um, and the good thing is that, well, the, the blue screen of the DES uh, version uh, heard is called Computer Board the Farmer, but it's just an error that you get when the server crashes, X2FS crashes, okay, you get Computer Board the Farm. Uh, but then, okay, you can continue working. Well, of course, it's bad if it's the root file system, but for uh, some, some mounted file system, it's, not, it's completely fine. And it's easier to debug these, and you can dare crazy things like uh, I will be showing uh, dynamic font support. Um, the kernel only manages 
a few things. Uh, so we can imagine, for instance, to have uh, the shell uh, looking into files in an ISO provided through FTP uh, over the network. And so this is done this way. So you uh, set a translator on TID slash FTP colon. So it's in your home directory as a user and telling it, OK, you use FTPFS and the root of the, um, uh, the service, the FTP server, you will be looking for. And you can do that once for good. And then when you log into the machine, you can cd tilde slash FTP colon slash slash something dot etc. And then you are inside an FTP uh, website, uh, an, an FTP server. And then you can click an, an ISO image inside the uh, FTP mount and mount that as an ISO uh, image on slash mnt and then uh, look at this and then you get the file and that only downloads the few tiny parts that ISO FS uh, needs to access that file and you can also store that permanently um, I show you I have this on my machine um, I have a signature file whose content is never the same because it's actually a, a translator in there and it's it works with all uh, mail agents that way. Um, so how does it work? The idea is that uh, actually it's the libc which does the POSIX part of the HURT. Um, since the kernel doesn't know about open file etc, when libc gets the open call, uh, it communicates with IOS, ISO FS to get um, uh, an open file etc etc. So basically it means that everything that happens in the HURT is an RPC. And it is an interposable RPC because, of course, the user can change libc, but not only th that, libc provides flexibility. Um, in particular, it's the virtual file system which provides flexibility, as we will see. Um, so the user can get to decide easily how to interpose things without having to tinker with things. People have been doing this with uh, fake root, ch root uh, is native, but fake root is really uh, something which is tinkering. Uh, some people have uh, virtualized the network with uh, some ptrace or whatever. Um, here it's native. That's the normal way of doing it. And so you can just use your slash home, uh, your, your home and the TCP IP stack and pile anything over it. So for instance, you can remap slash bin slash sh to your bin sh. So you create an, an, another view of the file system in which slash bin slash sh doesn't refer to the root slash bin slash sh but your slash bin slash sh uh, you can remind, uh, remap bin to a, new, a union mount of things well there are a lot of crazy things um, this is a really cra crazy thing but it does work uh, so I let you have a look. So you have OpenVPN, PFI.net, FTPFS, Part, X2FS, ISOFS, and then at last you have a shell. And it's not so crazy actually, because you have an ISO image inside a disk, which is hosted over uh, FTP, but on a remote uh, server over VPN. It's not that crazy. It, you may have to do this. Uh, uh, I think I had to do that uh, at some point. Um, and what? is interesting today is this relation um, between OpenVPN and PFINet. What happens here? Because uh, in the past what would happen in gnu is that uh, PFINet opens a kernel device because dr device drivers were inside the kernel uh, called ETH0. And what we did uh, for um, user and device drivers was to say, okay, this I, this used to be in the kernel, well, we'll make this appear in the file system. Um, so here is it. Uh, here it is. We have ETH0 inside the kernel, and uh, PFINet opens that. And so we made, we moved that into a userland process, which appears in slash dev slash ETH0, and PFINet connects to that. The really cool thing with that is that then it gives us uh, a really cool way of doing a firewall. You just put a filter in between and you can do this the way you want you can have a root controlled uh, filter and then a user controlled filter and then you have the, your user TCP IP stack there's no reason against this and so PFINet uh, here it's roots PFINet 
but then you can run OpenVPN over that TCP IP stack provided by root and uh, which creates uh, another uh, um, network device which appears in the users uh, who has uh, started OpenVPN and then you can run PFI net over that uh, virtual net uh, network device and have another uh, TCP IP stacks running on somewhere else in the file system, you can see that file and then run uh, a web browser over this. So how do you do that? Um, well, it cr you in the way we do it is actually starting first the TCP IP stack, telling it, okay, create a virtual um, network interface. It's actually the way you would do this in Linux. You actually you first create the interface and then you run OpenVPN over it. And so you you have started as a user uh, your TCP IP stack. You run OpenVPN to send and receive the packets, and then you can remap, saying, okay. Applications will open slash server slash socket slash two, which is the system provided TCP IP stack. And I will create another view of the file system where slash server socket two actually isn't the root provided server socket two, but tilde slash service socket two. So my own TCP uh, IP stack. And by the way, uh, the DNS server, I would prefer to use the one at the other end of the open VPN. So, okay, let's also uh, make slash etc slash resolve.conf uh, actually refer to my own uh, resolve.conf and so that way uh, I don't even have to modify applications to make them look at somewhere else or the libc actually which reads the file uh, to look at somewhere else and then you have a new shell which uh, has that new view and you can run wget on this and it's only using my as a user uh, translators. So now the interesting part for today, the DD stack. Um, so this is based on the, the TU Dresden uh, DD stack. Uh, it was actually the work of Zengda, uh, Google Summer of Code. I don't even remember. I don't even remember which uh, year, like five years ago maybe. Um, and he just ported um, DD. Uh, the DD stack both to the Mark kernel and to the Mark device interface. And well, uh, I updated uh, the libdd Linux 2.6 to get the 2.6.32 uh, Linux kernel support, uh, just because that's the long term maintained um, uh, kernel. And most drivers, and in particular the uh, really useful ones, that is not the virtual or um, high end. Uh, performance that you almost never find. Uh, these w just work without patches. Um, I think there are maybe one or two patches only. Um, so this is uh, this part, the libdd Linux 2.6, uh, somewhere that probably we should cooperate with people who are using uh, DD to upgrade that to newer kernels. Um, so DD stack is now used by default uh, in Debian GNU uh, and so we, we just use that uh, all the time now, nowadays. So this is what it looks like. So we have the kernel which provides almost nothing. I will detail after that. We have libdd Linux 2.6 which is a glue between the Linux API and the DD kit API. So DD kit API is a dedicated API just for this uh, which is the basics for a kernel essentially. So that is mutexes and um, la, um, interrupts and things like this. So there's a thin API that uh, Zengda um, put it over Mar to explain, okay, to start a thread, uh, you uh, create a thread with Mar, etc. And then you have the Linux API, this part we, uh, we didn't change it, we just took the Dresden uh, source code and then we have the Linux drivers uh, running over this. And uh, libdd Linux 2.6 provides uh, PKG XMET and uh, RX callback to have the uh, network packet transmission uh, receive and send. And then we have another part, which is libmar.dev, uh, which uses this to expose the usual way of doing network devices in, in uh, GNU Hub, uh, that is device read, device write. 
and thus PFI net can just open this and talk with uh, the user level uh, device driver netdd uh, transparently just opening slash drive slash eth0 instead of opening the, uh, the kernel device uh, we almost didn't modify PFI net we just modified the way to open the device and then we had the transmission port and the RPC was just the same uh, between uh, using the kernel device or the user land device. Um, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Do, do you run all the drivers inside a single process or can you run... Uh, Actually, we just them? took all the Linux drivers, put you know, stuffed them together and ran in one big uh, process so that people can just start uh, an image and get uh, their network board uh, running. But of course you could separate uh, compile uh, one NetDD for one driver, another for another one, another for another one, even if it's just the same uh, device driver and you would assign a PCI card for one, another for another one, etc. So you separate the use of the network ports. And then you could tell PFI Net you can use all of these separately. Um, and that brings me to, uh, no that's, that's for later, um, so the interesting part I didn't explain was uh, the additions to the kernel. So there are actually two uh, additions only. That is interrupt and uh, physical allocation. So we need interrupt to know that uh, a packet arrives on the network board. And al you also need DMA, so you have to somehow manipulate uh, physical memory. <coughs> and that's only it, that's like a, a, a few hundred lines, that's all. We already had a direct I.O. support, so the, um, the, the the process can access the device. The performance, well, I didn't really see any difference. Uh, we probably have uh, some bottlenecks uh, uh, somewhere else. At least we, we didn't notice really a difference. But the really cool thing is that since it's a separate process, well, you can just make it crash and be happy with it. I will show you. Um, I start a transfer. Um, oh, people. So getting a DVD ISO, and then I just kill the device driver. It takes a bit of time to get things back because basically we are rebooting a Linux kernel, a tiny Linux kernel, but basically we are restarting it. And then PFI Net didn't crash, it just started using the new instance. And then of course TCP works again because the, the state of the TCP connection is not lost. And so this, this is really good. And then of course since it's a process, you can debug it, you can profile it. We have tax smashing protection uh, here, of course, um, and well, we could benefit from IOMMU for better isolation because for now the driver can do whatever it wants with the memory, uh, because with the network board you basically uh, have DMA access to all the memory. Uh, so this is not implemented yet, but well, it, it shouldn't be too hard. Um, so the question is. Uh, could we use more of DDE? Uh, well, saying that tried with disk DDE, it's supposed to be working. The, the website I could read uh, said it was fine. Um, it shouldn't be really complex because it's also a matter of device write, device read at the proper locations. Uh, but he said that he didn't manage to make it work, but it, it was at the end of the summer of code, so maybe he just he didn't have the, the time to do this. Um, I've heard that there is USB sound EDDE, uh, I don't know uh, the status, the precise status. Uh, of course, we would love to uh, to have that. Um, with the uh, talk uh, in, uh, f um, earlier today, uh, which presented the RAM kernels, perhaps it's more interesting to use the NetPST drivers, which are more portable and probably uh, more careful about um, being able to be run by RAM. Um, maybe we could use that. Right. We can use both. You can, for sure, use a Linux driver for this card that only Linux supports, and then use a Net BSD driver for that card because you prefer it's well maintained, etc. Whatever. 
you can combine everything uh, the, the way you want. And with IUMMU, you could even give a PCI card to a user. See, okay, you can do whatever you want with this. Because the hardware uh, ass um, assures that there is no problem with this. Um, so I have time, that's cool, um, to present the userland console support. Uh, so Marcus, who is in, in the room, wrote it. It's um, a design which is quite similar to the screen. That is, we have a server part and a, a client part. The server is running the virtual TTYs, so get TTYs uh, are running on this. And then you have a client server interface so that a client can come connect to the server and show this on the screen with a keyboard, and mouse, and VGA, or uh, end courses, or whatever, braille devices, whatever. Um, and for, for, for the keyboard driver part, that's cool because then we can just use XKB to translate the key presses instead of maintaining our own key maps, etc. We just use uh, LibXKB uh, and then we have the support. And people are used to uh, the kind of uh, layout we have there. And for the VGA driver, and so it drives the VGA board, uh, we use just text mode for, uh, at the moment. Uh, but we are taking full benefit of this uh, thanks to the 500 uh, glyph support of uh, VGA. And we use them dynamically. That is, well, we have a static mapping of 32 to uh, 126, so that we are compatible with ASCII for a lot of cases like uh, QMU in text mode and things like this. But all the other glyphs are dynamically uh, allocated. So, for instance, uh, sorry, here it is. Um, I'm looking at uh, each ellipse, yo, ZH. So, let's show some Chinese. And this is VGA text mode. We are just loading the glyphs uh, as needed by what is currently displayed on the screen. I'm not sure that you would dare doing this uh, in a in a actually ring zero kernel. Um, and also we have GNU grid user, so when you're logging into um, the herd, you have a nice GNU meeting you. And uh, as I've shown, we have double width glyph support. Uh, in the Linux kernel, we don't really have this. They never dared doing this really. So we have a, a Chinese support in, in, in text mode. And it, it is really a native way of doing this. Uh, screen readers can read it, etc. Um, about the support, no, so software support is, is quite great. Uh, so we have Java, uh, Ada, uh, Go is ongoing. Uh, no, that was ongoing uh, this summer. Uh, I don't remember the, the um, what was uh, the, the result. Um, the herd is really quite POSIX compliant. Well, essentially because it uses the, the GNU libc, uh, which provides most of the, the support, but uh, we have also fixed a lot of bugs in the POSIX corners, like special cases of select, poll, or whatever. And so when we have a look at the test suite uh, failures of um, Perl and Python, etc., we are rather at the 99% uh, figure. Like in Perl, there are several thousands of them, and we have like maybe uh, 10 or even less, uh, 6, which are failing. Um, we have languages for translators. So that means uh, we have migrated to really using the POSIX thread library. And that means that for writing translators, the ones uh, I have shown, you can write them in Python, Perl, whatever. Well, of course, you need the bindings. Uh, we have um, Perl and Python bindings, I think. Maybe they need some care, but we have something working uh, already. Um, about the hardware support, so for now, we, we are mostly focused on 32-bit support. We have a start of a 64-bit support, the kernel boots. Um, what we need now is the conversion for RPCs to make the translation between 32 and 64, between the kernel and the user -learn. But for user -learn, user -learn, we don't have anything to do. Uh, the useful of this is just to have a lot of memory. Uh, for instance, I don't know if you have tried to compile an Excel runner, 
uh, for Mozilla, it takes a four, gig four gigabytes of memory. It's it's crazy, and for 32 bit 32 bit uh, architectures, it's really a problem. So we have Linux 2632 uh, drivers for network as a user learned process. We have ID support, XOR support. Uh, I've written an AHCI driver uh, a few months ago. Um, it needs a bit more testing, probably. It, it works uh, on my machines and uh, on QMU. Uh, so that's good for, uh, I mean, mid term uh, support of uh, systems. We have the Xen port, which provides us with a re um, quite long term support because. As soon as Xen can work on, on a machine, then we can run on it. Uh, we don't have USB no sound yet because nobody worked on it. Essentially, if you want to work on it, you're welcome. Uh, it's just not necessarily a priority for the people who are uh, running it. So uh, it, it, it's up to the people to, uh, to choose. Okay, I'll, wi I'll work on it. Um, for the software, uh, with another kind of view, it's really stable, really. I don't remember when I have reinstalled my boxes. They have been running for years. I, I don't remember. It, it was in like 2007 or 2006. I don't remember. Uh, the buildies have not been reinstalled since years like this. And they keep building packages all the time, day and night. Uh, they hang after some week, some usually, because, well, they are there is some remaining memory leak in some uh, some of the translators, so we have to fix that, but basically it, it does work. And we have a lot of software, actually. 79% uh, of the Debian archive builds uh, with the patches in Debian, but uh, we, we don't have modified them uh, more than what we have done already. Uh, so we have XFCE, almost GNOME, almost KDE. We have Firefox. Uh, running Gnumeric. We don't have open office yet because there are so many dependencies, but it, it's not invisible. It's just a matter of patching things here and there, saying no, this is not Windows because you have sometimes if def Linux else Windows. Okay, things like this. Um, so we have an installer. It works quite great because it's the Debian installer. Um, we had a release, a really nice release. I advise you to check that out. Uh, on April 2011, uh, Arc uh, released a live CD. Um, I've heard that some people are still working on it. Uh, I, I'm not sure about the state, but there, are, there is still activity on this. We have released uh, an unofficial Debian uh, snapshot uh, at the time of the Wheezy release. So it's mostly like Wheezy, not exactly because it's a snapshot of Seed at the time of Wheezy. So for the packages that had been uh, uploaded uh, in the meantime, it's not the same, but mostly it's the same. So we do have uh, something which for us is official, for Debian is not official. Uh, but we have this, you can try. And so we are really glad with this. And uh, just in time for the 30th, uh, birthday, in the 30th uh, year of GNU, we have released HERD 0 0.5. Um, I would have called it HERD 0 0.9 or even 1.0. Well, Thomas said, no, 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 let's say uh, 0 0.5. So people have said, OK, it's half finished. No. <laughs> no. It's not half finished. Really, it is working. The thing is, we cannot say like it's stable as Linux is. It is not. It's not as performant as Linux is. I mean, I don't think any operating system can know what it is. Um, so we call it 0 0.5, but really try it. Yeah, it, it. It is really working. So future. Um, there is nice thing happening in Xen for uh, the power virtualization to make it uh, even faster. Uh, so I plan to work on this when I get time. There is the 64-bit support uh, I mentioned. Uh, if you want to contribute, just, just feel free. It, it's, it shouldn't be so complex, and most of the work is already done. Um, there are languages bindings already. You could have your own for your pet language. Uh, just write it. Um, we want to implement read ahead 
which is killing us for the performances. We, we have an idea of how we're doing it. Uh, it has just not been a priority before we get things working really uh, stable, uh, stably. Uh, as I mentioned, maybe using a disk sound USB DD. Uh, we shall see. Uh, for the GNU part, uh, maybe we could use uh, Gix as a distribution of a herd. Uh, so th there was a talk about uh, GNU Gix uh, earlier this afternoon, so I advise you to have a look. Um, would we release with uh, Je Debian Jesse? Uh, well, most probably not, but at least I think we will do something uh, like we did for Wizzy. So we will see. And of course, you are welcome to have your own pet project. Uh, people uh, this summer who have seen the kind of flexibility you can have with the network said, okay, uh, we have a GNU project about um, uh, uh, VPNs, maybe that can be useful, and yes, that's the kind of thing that you can do with the herd, and it's really fun to see how you combine new things in a new way. So thanks, and if you have questions. Feel free to ask on the list. <laughs> <laughs>